Good afternoon. I think we'll get started. We actually have a panel, which means we have multiple opportunities for people to fall as they walk up and down the stage. Um, welcome uh, to the session on uh, the role of the academic library in improving institutional research impact and the evaluation of institutions uh, and of scholarship. I'm Molly Tamarkin. I'm the director of the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Um, I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Vijay, who is our manager of collections and services and uh, information services. Vijay, stand up, please. And I'm also helped with Mohammed Bayesa, our repository specialist. Daryl Grenz was supposed to be here. I'm subbing in for him. His, um, he has a new baby and has a wonderful and blessed excuse for not being here today. So I'm gonna start by just talking a little bit about KAUST. Um, KAUST started in 2009. It started with a vision from the king. I'm gonna skip ahead to right here. The late King Abdullah uh, had this vision of having a world-class research university in Saudi Arabia that would bring together the best minds in the world to create new tools and services to meet world problems. So areas of research at KAUST are focused on energy problems, on desert agriculture, on water. Um, some of our technologies that we've patented include things like automatic cleaning systems for solar arrays. If you can imagine a solar array in the desert, how dirty it might get and how difficult it might be to clean. We have technologies around, around, uh, around that, around making crops in the desert more viable. Um, our whole campus was built in three years. The king, when he had this vision, said, uh, make it so, and by the way, you have a thousand days. And uh, they did this, and it is a beautiful, beautiful campus. And now I'm not going to fall, but Why do you have a library? What is your library? Well, our library, as you can see, is really stands out as the heart of our campus. And right behind us, we have, I think, there are two pillars, the mosque and the academic administration building. And uh, we are between them and the Red Sea. This is our library. This is the beacon of knowledge, a symbolic structure on campus that reminds us all of why we've gathered from all over the world to be here in Saudi Arabia. We are the only, but hopefully not forever, the only co-educational university in Saudi Arabia, and we are truly diverse. There is no one country, well, Saudi Arabia is about 30% of our population, but after that, there is no other country that is in any majority. We have about 30% about 30%, 35% uh, of, our, of our community is from the Middle East, another 35% from uh, Asia and Europe, and then another 35%, say, from North America. Very, very diverse. So as a result, we all have to be forgiving of typos, of grammar, and have very thick skins as we learn to navigate each other's cultural ways. It's a really exciting place to be. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm not going to repeat any of that. It's a place. We work there. It's pretty cool. Um, we're going to talk about rankings and research impact and the role of libraries. Um, the role of libraries is changing. People no longer need to come there to get information. Why do they go? They go because the space is inspiring. Why do you go to a museum? It's inspiring. It's not just that the art is inspiring, it's the space itself is inspiring. So our library was designed and received an award from the American Institute for Architecture 
uh, for, for its architecture as an inspirational space for knowledge. It is a beautiful place, but our physical book collection is so small that one of our, uh, one of our staff members who never worked in a library before was shelving books. He pointed to a call number, we use the Library of Congress system, and said, what is that? <laughs> and if you have only about a couple thousand books, you probably don't need the kind of classification uh, that system that we have. But we use the LC system to coordinate with, of course, universities all over the world. But with our collection of the size, you can, it's a very browsable collection. So we'll be talking about the role of libraries in their contribution to understanding the impact of scholarship. Now, KAUST happens to be uh, funded, self-funded, by a generous endowment from the king. But that doesn't mean we don't have to measure impact. How do we know that the money we're spending on various research labs, researchers, uh, infrastructure is paying off in terms of impact? Even though we don't have to apply for NSF grants or other federal funds or uh, international funding agencies, we still measure impact and take that very seriously, especially as a new university where we're trying to attract the best and brightest talent. So world class, we have teaching, knowledge transfer, we have a global outlook, and we do research. And so how do we do rankings, and how can we help increase uh, the impact of scholarship? BJ is going to come up and talk about this. Thank you, Moni. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. So last year we were here. Uh, myself and Mohammed Baisa, we were presenting about our initiatives about open access and a repository, how it was impacting on our research. And after one year, we are he here again uh, presenting some of the latest things what we are doing in KAUST. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with uh, uh, rankings, university rankings, worldwide rankings, and as well as, I'm not sure. Uh, most of you think there is a libraries have a role to play in helping that institution uh, to, to, to come up in the rankings or to, to do good in the evaluations. So this is where we are trying to say a, a research-based institution and a library associated with a research-based institution, how importantly uh, we have to engage the librarians and the library, how importantly we have to engage in this kind of activity. So before going to what we were doing, let me give you some uh, idea how the uh, rankings works. So if you look at the Times Higher Education ranking, this is how universities are scored. So if you look at, you know, there is a international mix of staff, uh, then there is industry income innovation, teaching, learning environment, but there are some important things which libraries have a play like uh, role like uh, uh, if you look at this citation research influence and proportion of internationally co-authored research papers and papers for academic and research staff so if you if you uh, uh, add all these uh, scores it adds up to 38.5% of the total ranking so it is where you know libraries we, we are always talk about publications, right? We help researchers to do good research and write good papers. Uh, so we are doing that. This is where uh, we think, sorry, this is where we think libraries can uh, uh, influence somewhere. So libraries can help in improving the impact by increasing the visibility of the research. So libraries were always supporting researchers but providing through providing literature and research services to do the research. But after the publications, after the research publications, how do we improve the visibility of that research? What libraries can do? That is where we are focusing. So these are the three major areas we can focus. And this is another ranking system, Academy uh, Ranking of World Universities by, I think it's from Shanghai. So here again, 40% of the scores is coming out of the publications. So publication is a research output people are going to evaluate. So uh, just 
when I come back to Kaust as an example, Kaust exists for last six years. We started in 2009, as Moli mentioned. And within these six years, we are very proud to announce that we are number one in the world if you count citations per faculty. So when you uh, evaluate university, there are many other things like number of publications, number of staff, number of you know, students, number of uh, pass out students, number of people got employment, etc., etc. We are not top or we are not near even uh, within the first 500 or 600, but in the publications, citations, what we received, we achieved a, a, a good number as number one in the world. This is another ranking uh, done by Leiden University. This is purely focused on publications. So they count the publications which, uh, which appeared, you know, which is captured by Web of Science or Scopus in the last five years, I think. So in that, we are already in number 42 in the world. So this is about, uh, based on publications and Thomson Reuters Web of Science database for the period 2010 to 2013, and publications appeared in the top one percentile of the top journals. So we are number 42. So this is where we stand now, and still we can go ahead by, you know, where, where libraries can play a role. Uh, this is some, some of the uh, 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 slides from one, from one of my friend's uh, uh, presentation. He is the director of research evaluation in KAUST. So he evaluated KAUST publication field-weighted citation impact so you can see where KAUST is. Uh, he also benchmarked uh, KAUST with other uh, uh, similar type of universities. You can see where KAUST stand from this uh, uh, slide. So this is where, you know, a university is evaluated, research, prestigious awards, innovation, teaching, international mix, citation analysis, peer evaluation, and you can clearly see from this where uh, libraries can influence. Now I'm uh, going to hand it over to Moli and uh, uh, Mohammed Baisa for explaining further. I will come back. <laughs> Thanks, CJ. So it's very important that uh, for our reputation and to attract talent that we have a clear impact on the world. But it's also important that our faculty um, can demonstrate their value because of the business of the university and the way faculty are rewarded, which in a research university is through research and the appointment, promotion, and tenure process requires people to demonstrate the impact that their research has had. So the role of the library has, uh, in doing this includes the traditional role in supporting scholarly communication and providing access to information. It also includes having a repository that can perhaps um, connect with the current research evaluation or information system. If the library can be authoritative for faculty publications, that is a huge value to the university. We're taking a lot of burden away from faculty, freeing up their time for research. We're also giving it to our research evaluation office so they have a better understanding of how university funds are being, are being uh, spent. That's something the library can do. We also, in tracking output, we measure impact, and we need to give training and awareness for all of this because, as you know, everything is changing. Everything is a sea of acronyms that people can barely remember. Um, we have a research repository, and it was developed by Mohammed, who is going to talk about it in just a moment. Um, <laughs> back. I, I came about uh, a year and a half ago to Kaos. I was really lucky because Mohammed and Vijay were there and had already started building our library and the infrastructure. And when I arrived, we already had a repository. I didn't have to explain to anybody why it was important, why we needed it. And in fact, uh, Muhammad had led a committee to create an open access policy. So when I arrived, I just had to help push it through a little bit. And we became the first university, and I think the only university a library in Saudi Arabia that has an open access policy. 
There are many uh, university libraries in Saudi Arabia that have repositories, but we have a policy that mandates that we collect faculty research in a repository and make it freely available to the extent legally allowable and to everybody in the world. So we have our research repository, we have our open access pol uh, policy, and then we've done a few more things that Mohammed's gonna talk about that specifically help faculty demonstrate their impact. ORCID and, um, and some other metrics from a system called PlumX. So this is a picture of the entire social network of science. Conferences, funding, grants, usage, research domains, societies, publishers, opportunities, articles, none of this is any new. But because of technology, it's changing more quickly and we're getting more information. So, you know, earlier we talked about the need for libraries to transform, to demonstrate value. And I think that's, that's very, very important, but I keep thinking about, you know, a car doesn't have to demonstrate its value. We know what cars are good for. And if we can't, you know, understand the library's role in navigating this change, then we, are, we ourselves are not navigating this change successfully. Um, our role is, as ever is to provide information, information about information, and help with people navigating this world of information. So now, Mohammed, come on up, talk about the repository, and uh, introduce us to some of the tools. Thank you, Molly. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Mohammed Baisa, the Digital Repository Specialist at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. <clears throat> I'm very uh, proud that we are speaking for the second time. We joined the, CLA, uh, the SIPF ALA conference last year, and we were talking about establishing an open access policy at uh, uh, University in Saudi Arabia, which was the first open access policy in the region, not only in Saudi Arabia. And we were so very proud of that. So, uh, continues with uh, what Molly just uh, explained on the library role. If we look at the publication, then we could see that um, the most prestigious and reliable source for to find all the publication is in Scobus and Web of Science, right? So none of these um, uh, database has comprehensive and uh, uh, publications for for a particular institution. Even for cows, when we were looking for Scobus or Web of Science, we will find some articles which are just in Scobus, some articles just in Web of Science, and um, some articles are not. This is depend on the journals and depend on the publisher where you just uh, publish your articles. So relying in these resources to evaluate your own university's publication might be not only uh, the wise way to do it. So we decide to create a repository that will have all the publications from the universities. When we say all the publications, we are more comprehensive than Web, Web of Science or Scobos or Google Scholars, simply because we look at all of these sources and we collect the data from all these sources and then we analyze it and then we remove the duplication from all these sources and then we put everything in the repository. So we will talk about that, how we do it, and uh, all the tools that we develop to do this. Uh, this is, again, another slice. We take it from um, uh, our colleague and Kaos Research Evaluation Team. So here you can see uh, how they look at the evaluation at Kaos. They look at people, they look at lab, they look at equipments, they look at publications, at the research output. And then they want to connect all these pieces together. They are not only evaluating the researchers, they're evaluating the use of equipment, the use of labs. Everything is being evaluated. As Molly said, I mean, like, we need to make sure this money is being spending wisely, right? So this is one of the ways to do that. So what we do in the repository, simply we set up uh, notifications and feedback with most of the sources and we got all the data from these sources, then we analyze it, and then we put it in the repository, we contact the authors uh, as needed, and we will see that in the next slides, how we do it. So as we said just um, uh, earlier, Scobus, uh, Web of Science, uh, Google Scholars, and Crossref, 
uh, is some of the sources that we rely on to collect the data and also the publisher APIs. So we set our own database, we connect to all these sources, and then we collect the information, we analyze it, and then deposit it to the repository. Uh, how we search, how we set up the feed, is based on the affiliation, author name, ID, funding acknowledgement. So we track several ways of finding these publications or these research outputs. And um, <clears throat> we do find the duplications and we do remove it. And um, it's very interesting that um, when we contacted other departments within, within the universities, like uh, CAUS itself, it ha has a funding uh, unit. So there is a department that funds the CAUS uh, research, uh, uh, researchers. So when we contact them and ask them about the CAUS funded articles, we have more comprehensive data than they do because simply we look for, for different sources of information. Um. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay, so <clears throat> uh, how do we obtain the full text? This is a very big issue, and I have to say open access policy that we implemented last year helped us a lot and, and or give us the authority to collect this information. It gave us the authority to contact the faculty and say, by the name of CAOS open access policy, we need to get all the uh, uh, print version of your article. So we used to contact them even before the policy, but it didn't work out. So, you know, they, they, they will simply ignore us. And we don't have any authority in that. So it helped a lot of, uh, on, on, on giving us an authority to collect these articles. So when we receive a notification, there is an article published from Cal's author. The first thing we do is we, our team, we check the copyright of that journal. If that journal allows us to use the publisher version, we don't disturb the authors. We just go ahead and use it. If that article has a CC or a, a, a license, then and that license allows us to use the version, then we will just go ahead and use it. If we are able to find the author manuscript ourselves, then we will go ahead and use it. The last option is to contact the faculty and bother them and say, please send us the manuscript version of your articles. And we have been uh, trying several ways of contacting with the faculties. We start with contacting individual, and then we decided to contact all the co-authored, and that works out. I mean, like, the response was much faster. And we do have a dashboard internally to major the, uh, uh, the, the implementation of the policy and how is, uh, it's being I mean, like changing the way that we, we do uh, the deposit. We talk about this. Okay. So if we look at um, uh, the full text articles in the repository right now, it's very interesting that we find like 32% of them already have a CC. A CC is a common, uh, Creative Commons license. So they actually they have a CC, the Creative Commons license that allow us without the policy to collect the publisher versions and use it in the repository. And 20% um, um, uh, of them will be uh, allowing us to use the publisher versions. These, are, these publishers uh, actually generous enough or just an open access journal that will allow us to use the publisher version. And 46% that was uh, the impact of open access policy. So you could see almost the half of the collection was developed because of the implementation of that policy. When we look at the CAOS repository right now, if you go ahead and just uh, try to visit repository.caos.edu.sa, this is the numbers that you will find. So we have all the publications from the universities, all the metadata of the publications of the universities. So if you look, uh, if you look at Scobus only or Web of Science only, you won't find the same numbers, simply because we got all the, uh, uh, comprehensive and we got whatever is in Scobus, whatever is in Web of Science, and whatever is not in both of them. So we have 5,385 articles. Uh, metadata and 2,210 is a full text. And if you ask me why, because most of these articles, the 3,000 published before we have the open access policy. So we didn't have the authority to say, uh, to, I mean, like, to work in a, in a vast uh, published articles. <clears throat> and also we have a conference papers, uh, 1,144, uh, all the student thesis and dissertation. And all the student thesis and dissertation has to be uh, open access from the first thesis or dissertation written at cost. They are all available online and they are all available for full text, except 
uh, an option of embargo period for one year maximum if students need to maintain a, uh, a, patent, a patent or just uh, they are publishing some related uh, work. So uh, if you look at the bottom here, we could see uh, different other, uh, outputs, research outputs that we start capturing. We cover the, uh, the articles, we cover the conference papers, we uh, cover the thesis and dissertation. Now we move to another uh, type of research outputs. Posters, technical reports, patents, research data, data sets, all these are just uh, another research output that we need to capture and we need to uh, uh, deposit in the repository. Um, <clears throat> while we were searching uh, and finding our uh, KAUST articles, it was interesting. We found like more than 2,000 articles was funded by KAUST and KAUST was acknowledged as either by funding, fully funded or partially funded or just using of the lab or um, some sort of uh, collaboration. So we capture this information and we are working now on a project to get all the metadata of these articles in the repository. Also for the patent, uh, we found like there are uh, almost 280 patents uh, application from KAUST. So we, will, we are collecting this information and we will deposit it to the repository as well. <coughs> okay, so we collect everything. How do we uh, disseminate this uh, this information, right? So it's very important. We we create the data. Then now, how do we disseminate this data? How we will, will can find this data, right? So uh, we are integrated with Google, with the library side, with any hard fasters that is in the same domain. Like for the thesis and dissertation, there is an open access thesis and dissertation database. So we are integrated with that as well. So people, when they are searching that database, they will find our thesis and dissertation as well. So these are the ways that we are uh, integrated and people can find our works. And this slides give you the idea about the traffic that we receive in the repository. Like 35% was coming from Google Scholar. It's not from the repository itself. It's not from the library website. It was from Google Scholar. And 30% was coming from different sources. You can see like 15% was coming from the library website. Okay, I'll leave it with Molly now to talk about the add-on features and tools in the repository. Thank you. Um, okay, so now that you have your repository, you started collecting all this information, you can do what Robert was talking about earlier, which is some data analytics. But before you do that, you have to keep in mind that um, it's tricky to get all this information. And part of the reason why it's tricky to get all these articles is, well, it was demonstrated to me this morning when I was picking up my badge. The badges uh, were alphabetical by first name. And my first name is Molly, M-O-L is how it begins. So what name do you think comes right before Molly? It's a really popular name. What? Muhammad. And they were a lot. <laughs> So we keep looking and looking and looking and looking. And that's wonderful, except that there might be several people that have the exact same name as you. And in fact, they may actually be in the same field as you. How do you identify them? And so we implemented ORCID, which establishes a unique ID for researchers. That's a plugin that helps us manage our repository as well as scholarly impact. We also implemented PlumX, which, um, which uh, Mohammed will go into, Mohammed, Bayasa. We all have ORCID IDs. We'll go into in more detail. But first with ORCID, um, ORCID is a nonprofit that sits outside of all universities. Do, does everyone here know what ORCID is? Mm, I'm going to say no. OK, so it's out there. And it is an identification system. It's like LinkedIn. You create your own profile. I don't need my institution to do it for me. I do this as a researcher to identify myself. But if you integrate with ORCID, if we pay a membership, then we can get the API to harvest information um, and to connect those IDs with our uh, data in our repository. So, ORCID just gives you this ID, and that's really all it does. So I'm Molly Tamarkin, 
at some point I had a different last name. How do I know that that Molly Brennan and Molly Tamarkin are the same person? At some point I worked at University of Chicago. At some point I worked at Brooklyn Public Library. How do they know that that's the same person? ORCID allows me to manage my identity in a way that moves from university to university. As a university, however, it's our interest to implement ORCID's API so now we can connect this external identity system with our local identity system. So now we can incorporate those IDs into our repository so it makes it more valuable for data and analytics as well as uh, for, for researchers coming to our site to understand who's written what. Okay. So we can, uh, if you're going to come up and talk about the actual uh, specifics of integration, but what ORCID allows us to do is to take the metadata from our repository and move it into uh, our research information system. We're using PURE, but PURE is do you, it's by Elsevier. You can use other systems like Symplectic Elements. This is a tool that they have of harvesting information about people uh, to better evaluate their research. Again, without having a unique identifier, it's hard to know that the information you have is accurate. So this is one of the value adds of ORCID, not just for the library, but our implementation of ORCID created value for our research evaluation office because now they had a unique identifier as well. Okay, so Mohammed is going to talk about the details. Okay, so um, as just Molly was, uh, she was explaining in ORCID, uh, there are several reasons why we need ORCID. Um, first, to solve the name ambiguity, and second, which was not actually um, <clears throat> one of the reasons that we subscribe to ORCID, but it was coming from research evaluation, is for uh, affiliation. So when, when cast authors write an article and they just forget to change their affiliation, and the journal just publish their articles with all the affiliation, then that would not be counted, right? Because it's not connected to the university. So when we thought of all these issues, and then we thought, okay, now we need to implement this ORCID. What is the best way to implement it? So we, we developed our own tools to create ORCID. So if you are a CAUS faculty or a CAUS uh, authors, we will ask you to go to orchid.caus.edu.ca and register through that ABI. When you do that, you will grant a permission for us, for the repository, to write to your ORCID profile. Okay? So we maintain that from a registration point of view. And then we integrated the repository with ORCID. So every item submitted to the repository has an ORCID ID, will, will, will write that information to your ORCID profile. So simply we are connecting the researchers with their research outputs. This is very interesting. And if you think about gray literatures and an unpublished uh, area, then this is a very um, a rewarding tools to connect uh, non-published uh, materials like technical report. If I'm a, fa I'm a researcher and I would like to share my technical report and it's never been published and that report will be linked in my profile in ORCID, this is a very interesting, uh, we find it very interesting idea for our researchers. So um, here we can see this is the site when you go to ORCID.caus, you will see this one, then you will click next and you will uh, you can remove the permission. We give you the option to remove it. And, uh, gladly that none of our uh, authors has uh, actually clicked uh, and removed one of these options. So they all grant us uh, a permission to write to their ORCID profile. Okay. <clears throat> so um, how do we measure the success of ORCID? I don't know. Yeah. This slide. Maybe talking about, yeah. Uh, how do we measure the success of implementation? So we had that initiativity, we had ORCID, was it successful or not? When we look at uh, uh, our repository right now, 75% of articles and conference papers will have at least one ORCID uh, ID. Like one author will be having uh, an ORCID ID at least in 75%. 78% uh, of current faculties at CAUS have their ORCID ID. And we do maintain that ORCID ID in our database. 82% 82, 82 of uh, CAUS researchers and students with an ORCID ID granted a permission for us. So uh, uh, some students may uh, uh, leave, like move that options of writing to their profile. 
So uh, another tools that, would you like to introduce it or just go ahead? Okay, so Blumix. Uh, Blumix is just a very interesting way of looking or measuring the uh, research outputs. Normally the research uh, outputs or journal articles are measured by the citation, right? Number of citation you receive for your articles. But is that the only way that you can measure the impact of that articles or of that work? Just think about this conference. If we want to uh, measure the uh, success of this conference, wouldn't we be looking at uh, tweeters and see how many tweets, how many retweets, and all this social media usage for this conference to see how people were active for this conference? So when uh, Assembly Plumix is expanding, it's not actually removing any existing way of measuring, but expanding uh, the measurement of research impact. So it has five areas. Uh, they, uh, these five areas is, uh, uh, we, will, we will talk about them in details, like the usage, simply the download and the view. Uh, captures, when, you, uh, uh, when this information was captured from other side. And then citation information, which is already exists a long time ago. Uh, mentions and social media, okay. So how do we, in the repository, uh, connect the Blumix to the repository work? Simply, when we uh, plan for Blumix, we say that it will be restricted to ORCID ID. So we will not have multiple ways of connecting uh, the works or profiles in Blumix and uh, uh, our repository work. So we used ORCID to identify the authors. And in the first phase, we create a profile for every cow's faculty or every cow's researchers who has an ORCID ID. So when you implement ORCID, uh, you will have two levels of integration. Okay, The first level of integration is at the repository, at the item level on the repository. So if you deposit your article in the repository and you would like to see the impact of that article, you visit it, and you will find this little symbol here, right, in the right corners. This will tell you um, if, if your article was uh, captured in any five area, in any f five areas, then it will give you the information. So that is item level integration. So for each item. And then when you are a cows researcher or a faculty, then you will have your own profile in, in Blumix where you can actually have all your uh, uh, in, I mean like research output in a uh, repository uh, and, uh, and under, under your name and then you can develop uh, or you can report in a different ways for the whole uh, works that you have been doing. Okay, so this is an example of uh, one article that got uh, very popular and it will tell you in details like how many tweets, how many retweets, how many share, how many uh, uh, like and um, if there is a citation information, where it comes from, which journals and all this information you can capture it. Uh, and this is at the Blumix side. This is the dashboard where you'll find the profiles for each of these uh, faculties. So when you, once you click on the faculty name, then you will be able to see the impact. So we, we, we don't look at this as a replacement of citation or impact, but it is an indicator for faculties or for researchers of how their work has been received by the world. And also it provides us with more uh, analysis for uh, the information that we already have. Okay, uh, so for example, uh, if I want to uh, analyze uh, or uh, different research group within the universities, and then I can do that with Blumix because simply uh, the data in the repository is having that information. So you, can, you will be able in the repository to uh, subgroup the, the articles by program name or by uh, uh, divisions and by different ways. And the same way you can report and that based on that uh, uh, groups and subgroups. Uh, here is uh, a symbol of individual uh, evaluation. So if you would like to look at your uh, work as an individual and you have a profile in Plumix, then this is what you can do with, uh, with the data there. So uh, this is very interesting, I find it. Like uh, you can, in, in this one, you can find the Kaos articles in social media. 
So if we look at the three divisions at the universities, you can see that there is one division is high, scoring uh, really high other than two, the other two in social media. There is something in that area, right, that helps them in uh, uh, more uh, uh, sharing of their, uh, of their research output through the social media. Okay, uh, another interesting thing is for the thesis and dissertation. So, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the normal uh, index and abstract databases does not capture repository information. So, even if your thesis or, or dissertation has been cited, uh, this information will not be uh, captured within the Scobus or Web of Science. But this will give you an indication of how uh, your work has been received in a different ways, in other ways, sorry, like social media and other stuff. And also, we are looking at a tool that will integrate with the Google Scholars and that will allow us to see the citation information for an unpublished materials from COWS. So, and if you look at this, we got close to uh, 30 citation for student thesis and dissertation, which was very interesting. Um, and we, we try now to uh, integrate this tool with the Blamex so to provide more comprehensive um, <coughs> measurement of research impact. Okay, I'll leave it with uh, VJ talking about the outreach program that we do and trainings at the library. Thank you, Muhammad. So, uh, I'm sure all of you came to know about the tools and services what we provide. And it's also very important from library side to you know make our users, our researchers aware what we are doing and why it is important. So we do have uh, several training programs and uh, outreach programs in the campus. Like we do have Open Access Week. We invite faculty members and uh, uh, talk about you know uh, 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 research publication process. Uh, at KAUST, we also have different services like research uh, writing support service, graduate skills lab service, and library do run uh, different kind of uh, trainings. Uh, it includes, you know, even if, if a new student coming for MSc, we have students from different countries, different nationalities. All of them may not have the same skills what they needed to, you know, develop their writing skills or research skills. So we start from academic integrity, plagiarism, importance of publishing in peer-reviewed journals, what is the importance of H-index, for example, you know, what, or how the research impact uh, improve your own profile as well as the institution's profile. Everything we, we cover in these uh, training programs, including ORSID, Plumax, Open Access, Institution Repository, the importance of Institution Repository, everything. So the question is why we are doing this. We are, as we said, we are a very brand new institution, uh, you know, six years of existence. We don't have a big legacy behind there having, you know, hundred thousands of publications or hundred thousands of people graduated from us. So for us, you know, if you are missing one publication at least from the evaluation processes, you know, we are really, you know, that would be going to be affecting affecting on our, uh, you know, evaluation or ranking. So we don't want to miss out any of the great publications, any of the great research done by our institution. We want them to be visible as, you know, everywhere it's possible. And this is where library is playing this important role. Uh, so this is the feedbacks we usually receive from the, our research community. Many people, you know, talk to us, you know, we were not knowing about it. Like, you know, I'm just doing my research and publishing how it is going to impact the institution. Many people may not think. So when we explain these kind of things, they will have a feeling that, you know, okay, I am helping by doing a good research, by publishing in a good journal, I am helping my institution's profile coming up, my country's, you know, profile coming up, the whole region's research impact is coming up. So that is what we are trying to do. And these are all the feedbacks we have received from them. Uh, and uh, with this, I think, I will hand over to uh, Molly. So yeah, so after Molly joined uh, uh, almost two years ago, we have developed a strategic plan for the library for 2020. So uh, Molly will be talking about what's the future. <laughs> so thank you. 
So um, everybody talks about research data management, and of course we need to collect the data that supports our research, as well as the software environments that were used to create that data, as well as the operating systems and compilers that were used to, that software needed to run on. So our special digital collections and our research data management program kind of blend into both a collection of machine images, like what Robert was talking about, about a collection of virtual machines with data sets. With, we also have um, field researchers who are collecting specimens. So we have uh, images of corals, of uh, type specimens that are unique. And these digital collections are also uh, in our future and being developed now. All of this, though, couldn't happen without having that infrastructure that the repository brings you. It's just a place to put a bunch of stuff. But once you have that, you need to identify what that stuff is and who created it. And most important is the who created it, because that is what ties your faculty to your institutional success as well as their, their success as a researcher throughout their career. And to manage that, you need ORCID, which is a persistent identifi identifier that faculty manage throughout their careers. It's not a system that we created, it's a system that we purchased access to. However, for any individual to use ORCID, it's completely free. It's only when we wanted to harvest information did we uh, have to make a payment. So we needed that identifier, we needed the repository, and then, because the traditional citation stuff wasn't really enough, we needed a way of measuring things like social media. How many tweets did something get? Was it mentioned on Facebook? And that's what Plum X gives us. It, all, it complements our traditional citation systems. So these tools uh, are really helping us deliver services to the university in a way that just goes beyond information. But, we also need to train people how to use them and to describe the importance of these tools and hence our outreach about this. So that is our presentation. Um, thank you all and we'll take questions. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, all the presenters for this impressive uh, presentation. Uh, I just get the feeling that uh, all these uh, are English-oriented, uh, uh, while it is, I think, uh, an Arabic uh, university, or uh, it's it's, a, it's in an Arabic uh, environment. So I uh, did not. Uh, see anything about challenges uh, concerning the Arabic uh, collections, uh, whether these uh, systems are working with uh, uh, co this collection. Thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, when CAUS was created, it was decided from the beginning as an English-only university. That has made everything very simple for us. We have people coming from all over the world the language of teaching uh, and scholarship at House is English, and our collections are solely in English. However, I want to talk about this in a different perspective, because I was at a session uh, created by, the, um, by UNESCO in Cairo on research repositories. And we had representatives from all the Gulf there. And what happened was, you know, I might have spoken and suddenly the conversation turned to English when the majority of people were, were Arab speakers. And we spent a long time as a group discussing how, the importance and, and whether it is important to have the Arabic tools. And people went back and forth on this because they consider English to be the language of science. So I can't speak to that issue and maybe Mohammed, you can. But I think that's a, it's a big question outside of just coast. Um, 
Well, we, we can, we can, definitely we can um, translate the metadata to be in Arabic, but still the content is in English, right? The thesis is written in English, uh, everything is written in English, and the media uh, uh, of teaching is in English. So, at this stage, we don't feel it like it's uh, feasible for us to translate this and provide it in Arabic, um, like in terms of metadata, uh, because it still will not be useful. You will not be able to interpret the content, which is still in English. Um, and I think um, you're right. I mean, like, um, it's the decided from the beginning that uh, the, t the teaching and all the media will be in English. So the same thing is uh, repository and other services was developed in English. Can, can, can anyone uh, speak to this question about the difficulty of implementing these tools in an Arabic language environment? Yeah, I don't. Saif al Jabr Sultan Kabul University. I know that uh, our university has. Uh, the depository uh, and, they are, and it's bilingual, Sultan Kabus University. Uh, and they have uh, both languages because um, our faculty is uh, in Arabic and in English. We have the scientific uh, faculties in English and the uh, social science faculties in Arabic. And uh, they are using uh, the depository for both arti uh, for articles in both languages and it's working with them. I have a question though. Um, how does the how do you, th do you think that the visitor is promoting the library, the cost library? This is the first question. And uh, do you have any uh, 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 cooperation with other universities in, in, in Saudi Arabia? Because I know there are some active universities with, with uh, English publications. So uh, do you have uh, these uh, relations with them? Or are you intending to make these relations with them? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the second question first. Um, we don't. We have some memorandums of understanding with two, two entities in Saudi Arabia. One is the Saudi Geo Ge Geological Survey in Jeddah, and w we get their maps and their geological data. We share information with them. We have another memorandum of understanding with CACS, the King Abdullah, uh, Kim Abdullah Aziz, uh, City of Science and Technology. Yeah, which is uh, in Riyadh. And we are, we are working together to share our research into the Saudi research database, which is an Arabic database, so that when researchers in Saudi Arabia are con contemplating a new topic or a new, a new um, thesis or something, they can look and see what's happening at KAUST. So we're working with CACS, which is the keeper of that, on doing, on doing um, and sharing our research that way. But it is difficult because of the language difference. And um, there is a Saudi digital library that is mixed English and Arabic that we've been interested in using for data mining purposes. Because one thing that happened with the Saudi digital library, which is really fascinating, is when they licensed collections, they said, you know, we're not going to just license the access. We actually want that data. And so the question, I don't know if you heard earlier, I asked Robert about how do you get behind the paywall to do data analytics. Well, with the Saudi Digital Library, they actually, per, they just, they, they're hosting it locally. So we could be doing more with that service to mine that data, and that's something we hope to explore. I'm sorry, I can't remember your first question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, of course, you know, repository services. If you look at the whole scholarly communication services what we provide, of course it increases the visibility of library in the campus, in the community, definitely. And uh, because our university do have a very uh, strong evaluation system, and the evaluation system what we use, get data from the repository. So repository is the main data feeder for the, the evaluation system. So these two things, you know, definitely increase. And we do have subject specialists in uh, different disciplines. So they do work you know, directly with the researchers and faculty from those disciplines, and they are the license for repository. So there is a link. Yeah. I, I also just want to speak to that, though. 
because our university is so young, we don't have a tradition of the library as the heart of scholarship. This is where you had to go. This is the reading room. These are the beautiful spaces, the library that's existed for 100 years. Our library is beautiful and inspirational, but there are very few books in it. And I'm not even sure that many people realize that this is a library. I mean, what is a library? Is it a place where you work? Is it a place where you get information? Is it a website? I mean, it's a pretty nebulous concept right now. So our physical space could be viewed as a coffee shop with a lot of study rooms and a couple of books. You know, that's our library. It's also inspirational. But in terms of marketing our library to the university and our outreach, it's really about the staff. What, what do we do? Are we helpful? Are we helping the university achieve its goals? And so in that sense, um, they are seeing this as an extension of the library. But it's also true that I think increasingly people aren't really sure what the library really is. Uh, you know, used to call it the, the knowledge commons or the scholarly, you know, arena or something. It's, it's a variety of things. We, we still can have Arabic questions, if you have Arabic questions. Yes, there is another one. Um, this is Huda Iqbal. I'm the assistant librarian at Abu Dhabi University. Um, at the university, we do not have a, a repository as of date. We are li looking into the possibility of uh, having one. And thank you very much for the excellent presentation, by the way. My question is to Mohammed, And I only want to ask how much of a programming perspective, like uh, how much of a programmer's expertise is required to integrate Plumex with your repository? Well, um, the first thing is uh, the IT center at Kaos decided to move everything into cloud in 2011. So we have our repository uh, in cloud. It's, uh, it's provided as a service. So we don't really need the technicals or programmers to deploy the repository. So we have it just as a service from uh, uh, very uh, good companies. I mean, like, I don't want to market for them, but we have been working with them for five years, and we are very satisfied with them. So uh, we didn't need any programmers at the beginning. However, we, um, like myself and my uh, colleague, Daryl, is from an IT background. So we do develop some ABI integrations, and we do develop some uh, tools which can I mean, like database which can read uh, from other sources and then provide us in that databases for analysis. But for actual integration, uh, it's, it's very minimum, very minimum. And actually, it's mostly done by the, uh, by the host, by the company that provides uh, the host servicing for us. Thank you. Here, uh, you explained, uh, well, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it is uh, uh, this one. My question to Mr. Vijay Kumar. Uh, actually, last year you are so familiar here SIBF, SIBF uh, ALA conference. Last year also, it's, it's, it is a continuation of the updation. I think so. Uh, the last year presentations, and here I would like to know the you showed some details here. But let me know the required manpower behind your. I can we can understand your hard working. Uh, skills behind this, all these things. So, uh, how are the manpower and uh, what type of technology you are using for all these things? So, please, could you explain all these things? Yeah. I think it's a big question. <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, manpower, we have uh, 25 staff, and half of them are professionals, professional librarians. Uh, and as uh, Baisa mentioned, uh, uh, the repository is managed by an outsourced uh, uh, agency. But we do need to have people daily doing things, you know, checking things. So we have three people working for the repository itself. And for the outreach program in my group, we have three subject librarians in the campus. And for the outside outreach within the region, we have an outreach team newly built. So, you know, uh, if, if you talk about, uh, you know, manpower, there was a saying that, you know, when everything goes electronic, digital, you know, librarians' role will come down and you don't need too many librarians, but that's not right. There may not be librarians working in a library. There are people coming from different disciplines. We have IT people, 
we may have marketing people working in the library so because the role of library is changing it's not as molly mentioned it's not only about a repository of books you may not find a books in a library maybe who knows because in, if you come to our library you will see very few printed books because our 95 percent is collection is electronic so even without coming to the library they get the services so that is where and about the, the other one was finance right no technical technical yeah what type, of, what type of technology are you seeing? We're using um, I for our ILS, and we're using DSpace for our repository. Both of those services are hosted for us. We have a systems librarian and a systems coordinator, so two people who just do all of the systems work. Mohammed's team with Daryl and Han, team of three, do some of the systems, the, the web development for some of these applications, and manage the repository. If you're starting a repository, one of the best things you can do is get um, somebody to do data cleanup, data entry. It's not a programming position, but you almost cannot implement a repository without having somebody who's able to look at large amounts of data and clean it up. So we have Han, who is a part-timer, or she's a temporary staff helping us with the cleanup. And that's not really technical, but it's really vital to getting this done. Other than the library manpower, are you getting any help from the uh, research scholars or anyone? From the who? Uh, other than the library staff, are you getting any support or assistance or any help from researchers or anyone? Or researchers have been very supportive and that's what they can give us is their support. We haven't been getting, um, no, but no like technical help and certainly not from central IT, which is much more of a commercial kind of uh, product-oriented group. So um, I've noticed with researchers, even our computer science group, if I, I did make the horrible mistake of going to them when I arrived and saying we're doing some interesting things with data, maybe your students would be, who are studying informatics would like to work with us, and that was a horrible idea because he immediately said, we're not your programmers. You know, we're researchers, and and I, ha I still have to rebuild that relationship, let's put it that way, so. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the fantastic presentation. Uh, actually, these tools and services will be useful for other libraries also. So I have one question. So actually, we are also, tra I'm from Khalifa University, Abu Dhabi, working as system library. So I have one question. Actually, we are also trialing uh, Plumex and also ORCID organizational subscription. So have you done any analysis of other all metrics tools before selecting Plumex? Yes, um, we, we evaluate Altmetric all right. uh, and Plumex, and we find Plumex more comprehensive for us, so we went for Plumex. But my advice with you is uh, it's all rely on your data. All right. So don't think that the tool will be able to Provide the reporting that is could provide for you if you don't have a clean data that support those tools to operate. So it's all about the, the the data that you have, how you categorize it, what is the subgroup, because you cannot report on or you cannot compare two divisions if you don't have an information that can distinguish articles between two divisions, right? So you need to have that information before you go and implement uh, any tools, whether it's Plumex or any other tools. So look at your data first and see how it is uh, categorized and before you decide to, to, to go for any tools. Thank I you. hope this was helpful. Thank you. I'll make it very quick. Obviously, there's great interest, I think, within the UAE and probably in other regional areas here in establishing repositories and some of the great services you're providing over there. I noticed one of your key points at the end was outreach services to the region. Can you tell yes. us a bit more about that very well, quickly? Well, uh, Nada, you, yes, stand up. <laughs> this is Nada Mercy. She's our regional uh, outreach specialist. And we have just created this position. She's been doing outreach for the library. We're making it more formal. So I'm happy to exchange cards. We'd love to uh, 
to come and, and talk or invite people to come to Saudi to see what we've done. It's all of this is really, really, very simple, extremely helpful, and anything we can do to make it easier for others, it would be fantastic. I, and I know we would love to see what you're doing that would uh, be something new for us too. So thank you.